I believe I can prove to you that the statement on the screen is one of the most important topics in all that Jesus ever taught. And I know that we often hear about uh, those who pray and say, we pray that the preacher will preach on the topic that is most needed at this time. And I've been aware of the fact that Luke chapter 12 has been in my Bible for years. I've known the story of the rich fool. And yet I will be honest with you, until this last year when I was preparing this message, I had never noticed something else. And that is that the topic that is introduced here in Luke chapter 12 does not stop for the rest of the book. And I want to just spotlight that for you today and let it jump off the screen or off the page at you. I'm going to be going rapidly through some of these scriptures with some phrases spotlighted to show you that this is what we're talking about. Now, as we go back to the original text that we began with and the good reading we just had, you'll notice that uh, there's an interruption of our Lord, but what you don't notice, because it's a few verses before this, is that Jesus has been talking about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is no small matter. And this man interrupts Jesus' teaching on sacred matters to try to get Jesus to referee a family dispute over the inheritance. Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you when it comes to these physical matters? That's not my jurisdiction. But then I want you to notice the first pronoun in verse 14, he said unto him, but now watch the pronoun shift, and he said unto them, he wants the whole, since this man has brought it up, Jesus now knows everyone in that crowd that's listening to him is thinking about the importance of material things versus sacred things, and so Jesus says unto them, the whole crowd, take heed, beware of covetousness, and then that famous statement, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. That's not how things are measured on the day of judgment. Well, what's the square footage of your house? How many cars do you have and how nice are they? Show me your portfolio. Jesus isn't interested in any of those things on the day of judgment. And thus he tells the story of the rich fool who was doing so well. He was rich already. He's called a certain rich man. And he brought forth plentifully, and he actually thought within himself. And you start seeing the problem right away. The middle letter of the word sin is the letter I. The middle letter of the word pride is the letter I. And this man has an I problem, and I'm not talking about this. His problem is me, 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 my, 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 I, I, I. Notice he thought within himself. He's not looking to God for answers. If he were, then he would think, well, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be benevolent toward those who are poor. I've got surplus grain. I, this is a perfect opportunity. But no, he's thinking within himself. There's mistake number one. What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns. Whose are they? They're mine. I will build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And he said, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then who shall those things be which Thou hast provided? Oh, you provided all this? I thought every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, James 1, 17. But this man's patting himself on the back for providing all these things. They're his. And Jesus wants to get our minds focused where it should be, on him as the source of our blessings, not on ourselves. And he says, you're going to die tonight. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then notice verse 21 gives the commentary. So then is he that layeth up treasure for, it's all about self, and is not rich toward God. 
Now, that would be a marvelous thing to include in this book, and even if it were there only once, it would be very important and very interesting. But I want you to see how we go from the rich fool to what Jesus now says to the disciples. He wants his disciples, therefore, whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you stop and see what it's there for. In view of the fact that you could die tonight and all that you have would not be of any value except for your soul, you ought not to take any thought for what you're going to eat or wear or a drink because God's going to provide you. But notice this one phrase that jumps off the page or the screen at us. Life is more. Life is more than. Life is more than what? It's more than meat. It's more than raiment. Life is about much more than that. Solomon, did you ever learn that, that life is more? I thought I could get more and more and more and more stuff, and I'd find more and more and more happiness. I found more and more and more misery. Solomon, what's the answer? More and more and more obedience to the commands of God. Fear God, keep His commandments. Now, remember Jesus told His hearers here in Luke 12, look at the birds, the ravens. They never plant a crop. They don't sow, they don't reap, yet they never go hungry. And, you know, God feeds them. How much more? Are are you not better than the fowls, the birds of the air? And I know, listen, I'm not suggesting there aren't challenges that might be facing us with empty shelves or uh, gas lines or things that might be coming down the pike in the future weeks that might challenge us. But I do want to remind all of us of something. If you... We'll remember Psalm 37, 25. I've been young, I'm now old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You're, you may be hungry for a day or two or a while, but I promise you, if you seek first the kingdom of God, somehow, some way, God's going to provide the things that we need. He does it for the birds. Are we not more important than the fowls of the air? And uh, listen, consider the lilies. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet even Solomon in all his glory wasn't arrayed like one of these. And so God's got you. He's going to take care of us. How much more will God clothe you, O ye of little faith? Luke chapter 12 and verse 28. And I love this expression that I'd really never given proper attention to in my own study. Neither be ye of doubtful mind. Don't be of a doubtful mind, always doubting and wondering, how, well, how's this going to work? And what if this happens? And what if that? What if this? We can get in such a, a tither about these sorts of things that we start living in fear rather than in faith. And we've got to be careful about that. Our Father knows that we have need of the things that we have need of, according to Luke 12 and verse 30. And if we'll seek the kingdom of God, Matthew's account says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. Same concept here in Luke 12, the things that we need, all the things that are necessary to life, food, shelter, and clothing, God will find a way to add that to us. We'll be fine. Everything will be all right. Don't be afraid, little flock. Fear not. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so, he says... Give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old. But here's the the phrase I really want us to focus on. Instead of being like the man that started this whole discussion, make, make my brother divide the material family inheritance with me. Get your mind off the material and think of treasures in heaven. That's what Jesus wants. A treasure in the heavens that fails not. They cannot be stolen, they cannot deteriorate or rust or corrupt. That's why we need to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, because where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. Now it's interesting, in Luke's account in chapter 14, he says, when you make a dinner or a supper, don't call your friends, your best friends, or your kinsmen, or your brethren, nor your rich neighbors, thinking, well, If I invite them, they'll invite me later on and they'll recompense me. They'll pay me back. He says, no, don't do that. Focus instead on those things that matter material, spiritually speaking. But now we go from the rich fool to the rich young prodigal. And yes, he was indeed rich for a time. He 
he uh, tells us about a certain man that had two sons, and you remember it was the younger of them that said to his father, give me, give me what? Give me, give me, give me, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. He doesn't want to wait for his father to die to receive his portion of the will, of the inheritance, of the estate. I want it, and I want it now. Give it to me right now. And so what a selfish attitude, and look at what it leads to. He didn't stick around long, not many days after. The younger son gathered, how much did he take with him? He took it all. He wasn't planning on coming back ever. Gathered all together, took his journey into the far country. There he wasted his substance with riotous living. Oh, it seemed like I had so much, and where did it all go so quickly? It's a story that has so many verses to that song, and they're all sad verses. When he had spent all, he spent everything he had. He's now desperate. He's actually in want. He began to be in want, which he had never been when he was serving and living with his father. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Now, you have to try to put yourself in the hearer's ears here. These Jews to whom Jesus was speaking regarded swine under the law of Moses as an unclean animal. For this Jewish boy in this story to resort to field to the fields to feed swine would have been considered such, such a degrading thing for him. And he was so hungry, he would have even taken some of the, the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. Give me, give me, give me, Father. So his father gave it to him. And when he ran out, it's like, I don't have anybody to give me stuff anymore. I guess I'm going to have to, to work for it. And then he comes to a recognition in Luke 15, 17. He says, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and then some to spare? I'm perishing here with hunger. You see, sin takes you further than you want to go, as we sometimes say, keeps you longer than you planned on staying, and it never does give you what it promises. It promises you liberty. It brings slavery. That's what sin does. So we see the rich young prodigal. Jesus, are you done talking about riches in the book of Luke? It was brought up there in Luke 12, and now just about every single chapter, you're visiting the subject again. Here's the rich man and Lazarus. You know it. You know the story well. The Bible tells us about a certain rich man. But I don't know if you've remembered what led to this story of this certain rich man. Before you ever get to verse 19 of Luke 16, start in verse 13 and notice this. Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. He's either going to hate the one or love the other, or hold to the one, despise the other. You can't serve God in mammon or money. You can't. Now, why would... Uh, the next statement be included because unfortunately this is the attitude of even some today. The Pharisees also who were covetous. Jesus, what did you warn against in Luke 12, 15? Beware of covetousness. A man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Jesus, did you bring that up again? I tried to tell you what happened to the rich young prodigal when he had so much stuff and then had nothing. Riches can be taken from you just so quickly. And let me tell you about a rich man who had it all while he was alive. In fact, uh, the Pharisees are deriding, mocking Jesus over his teaching on materialism and the things that they don't like hearing. Jesus says that that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And then he starts with a story. There's a certain rich man. He's clothed in purple, fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. He's got the finest clothing, the finest menu on the block. You, he lives in a gated community, a gated home. There's a certain beggar at his gate. His name is Lazarus. He's He's full of sores. He, he's not in a good position. In fact, all he wants, he's so hungry, he'd take crumbs. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But what happens? The beggar dies. And he's carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. What happens? The rich man also dies. Death is the great equalizer. You think, well, I've got it made. I'm living in a mansion today. 
Tomorrow you'll be living in eternity. What Then what? Then what? This rich man died and he left behind his palace. He left behind his fine clothing and his wonderful uh, sumptuous me- feasts. He left it all behind. One guy was walking by the renowned Wall Street financier J. Pierpont Morgan back in the early 1900s when his body lay in state in New York. And one businessman said to his businessman buddy, he said, uh, reckon how much he left behind. And his buddy said, he left it all behind. Of course, his buddy was wanting a number, you know, how much, wonder how much he's worth. What's his net worth? It doesn't really matter on the day of judgment, does it? Is your net worth, if it's $2 billion, does that change things eternally speaking for you and for me? It does not. So where is this rich man now? He's in hell. He's in torments. He lifts up his eyes. He looks so far off there. He sees Lazarus. He says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. (laughs) Make him my errand boy. Send him and let him take the tip of his finger dip it in cool water and then touch my tongue with it. I'm tormented in this flame. And you remember he's told, son, you had your good stuff in your lifetime. You received your good things, Lazarus, evil things. But, but now, and this is the contrast, he is comforted, thou art tormented. Ask yourself, one second after you die, What material possession that you have is going to be of comfort to you one second after you die? The fact that you might have lived in the nicest house on the block, nothing wrong in and of itself with that. You might have driven the best car, had the best wardrobe. You might have had the most money in your bank account. But on the day of judgment or on the day of your death, all of that's going to be pointless and meaningless. Because once you die, there's a great gulf fixed. There's no crossing over from one side to the other, according to Scripture. And you remember that all that uh, this Lazarus, all that this rich man wanted was for Lazarus either to come and give him some water, but also let him send him to my brothers so they don't come to this awful place of torment. Luke chapter 16 and verse 28. And Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, but if one went to them who rose from the dead, they'd really that'd get their attention. And the explanation is given. They won't, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they wouldn't be persuaded even if someone rose from the dead because Moses and the prophets are certainly proof positive that the inspired word of God. And listen to this statement that matches up with Luke 16. It's from Psalm number 49. Don't be afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry, what does he carry with him? He shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. We named our youngest son Michael after a 24-year-old, 26-year-old young man named Michael. When I preached in Knoxville, Tennessee, I was able to work with Michael and his brother Jeff. Their last name was Savage, and I was able to get them to come back to the Lord, and they were restored after having been away for a number of years. He came to me and he said, I got two words for you, getting married, would you do the ceremony? And I said, I'd be honored to. I studied with his girlfriend before that and baptized her into Christ. And so I was going to do his wedding. I did do his wedding. And then not long after that, he said, the doctor's trying to diagnose a, an infection in me. He thinks it's an infection. Turned out to be cancer. And by the time they'd figured out what it really was, it had already gone through his body and done too much damage. And when he was 26 years old, I preached his funeral. And at that same time, Howard Stern, who's still on television in some programs and still has his shock jock radio program where he is allowed to say whatever filthy things come into his mind, and he's paid a $100 million contract there at the beginning when he first signed it. And here he is living in a mansion, in a palace, spreading filth into the world, while my dear friend and brother in Christ is withering away on his couch, dying of cancer. 
and it just didn't seem right. And I realized that this life does not settle all accounts. God settles them in eternity. Friends, though while he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when you do well for yourself, you'll go to the generation of your fathers and you'll never see light. You're going to leave it all behind and there will be no returning to your possessions. They're going to be gone. Jesus, are you done talking about this subject now in the book of Luke? No, the very next chapter. Luke 17, remember Lot's wife. What is there to remember about Lot's wife? Would you notice the text leading up to this, Luke 17, 28? In the days of Lot, what were they doing? Eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building, the things that we do in everyday life. Sounds like a booming economy is going on. Things are going well. But I want you to notice, please, that the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now what? All that stuff is going to be left behind. Yes, and now it's, it's being consumed by fire and brimstone. Yes, it's going to be consumed. And so even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, the person on the housetop, he, he'll come, his stuff in his house, he won't even come down to take it away. His, his material stuff won't matter to him anymore. By the way, do you know that when the Titanic started sinking, that these people who had diamond bracelets and diamond tiaras in their staterooms were running back not to get their diamonds, but to get oranges and other things like that so that when they boarded the lifeboats, they'd have something to keep them alive. It's funny how just a moment can change your whole perspective on what matters in life. Remember Lot's wife. What should I remember about her? She turned into a pillar of salt when she looked back, and it wasn't just the physical look alone that was the problem. It was what was behind her desire to look back. And God had warned about this, and she did not listen, and her heart was obviously in material things because that's what she longed for and gazed back at. Remember Lot's wife. Don't focus on the material things. Remember the spiritual things. Don't seek to save your life. If you do that, you'll lose it. You lose your life, you'll actually preserve it. Jesus, are you done talking about this subject? Next chapter, Luke 18. Here comes the rich, young ruler. As a matter of fact, this certain ruler asked Jesus, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, here's a good question. This is about spiritual things. Jesus says, now, when you call me good, do you really know what you mean when you, no one's good but God. Are you calling me God? That's the essence of what Jesus is saying here in verse 19. When you call me good, are you calling me God because you really think I am? Because no one's good but God, so what are you calling me? What do you, what do you think about me? You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. He said, I've kept all those from my youth up. And then Jesus says, you, okay, you lack one thing, just one. I want you to go. Sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. If I sell all my stuff and give it away to the poor, then I don't have my stuff anymore. Oh, but you'll have treasure in heaven. But I, I, I'm more enamored with my stuff than I am some illusory treasure in heaven I can't see right now. That's the attitude of this rich, young ruler. When he heard this, he was very sorrowful because he was very rich. Very rich. And a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses, but this man thought it did. His life was wrapped up in his stuff. And the moment he was going to be disconnected from his stuff is the moment he thought he was going to be disconnected from happiness. Friends, he was very sorrowful, full of sorrow, and Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful and said, how hard it is, how hardly shall they that have riches 
enter into the kingdom of God. He said it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Fortunately, there are some rich people like Abram who kept God in the right place. He was very rich in silver and gold and cattle, according to Genesis 13. But you know what? That's an unfortunate exception to the rule. Most folks allow their stuff to come between them and God. You don't have to let it come between you and God, but so often men do. The fact they think, well, if that's the criteria, who then can be saved? And you remember Jesus answered, well, things that are impossible with men are possible with God. And then Peter says, well, you know, we've left a lot. We've left all, actually, and followed you. We left, I left the fishing business to become your disciple and follow you. And uh, he said to them, there's no man that has left house or wife or parents or brethren or children or lands for the kingdom of God's sake, he says, who shall not receive, watch this, manifold more in this present time. Yes, even now you have more. The Christian life is the best life in this life and in the life which is to come, according to the text here in Luke chapter 18 and verse number 30. In the world to come you have life everlasting. Tell me what price tag you can put on that. I'm going to live forever and I'll never have to hear the words about this virus or this cancer or that car accident or this aneurysm or any of those other things. It'll all be over and I'll be living forever and never have to die. What a wonderful thing that will be. Jesus, are you done teaching about this very next chapter? The rich tax collector. You know him as Zacchaeus. Jesus was passing through Jericho and Here's this man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief among the publicans. And notice he was rich. Now the way he'd gotten his money was by unfortunate dishonest means. And Jesus Christ was coming and he wanted to see Jesus. He'd heard all about him. And so because he was short in stature, he had to find a, a way to be able to see so he ran up ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree. And he knew Jesus was coming that way. Jesus came to the place and this shows Jesus knew. He stops. He looks up. He sees the man in the tree. The man's not introduced himself, but Jesus knows who he is. Zacchaeus, hurry up and come on down. Make haste and come down. Today I'm, gonna, I'm going to go to your house. And he made haste, came down, received him joyfully. Well, when they saw it, they murmured. They said, look, this man is going to be a guest with a man that's a sinner. Why would Jesus want to hang around sinners like that? Zacchaeus stood and he said, Lord, the, the half of my goods I'll give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I'll restore it fourfold. And Jesus said, this day is salvation come to this house. He's also a son of Abraham, and the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And uh, Zacchaeus has made a choice today to give up his riches to follow me. Would you be willing to do the same? Jesus, is this the last time? No. Look at Luke 19. End of the chapter. You've got these thieves that are depicted in the temple, in Luke 19, all the way through verse 48, verses 45 to 48, there he was in the temple. He began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying, my house is the house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. Tell me, what are those men doing in the temple? Are they to worship? Are they to, there to do spiritual things? They're there to make a buck. The, the kind of money that they would have made in that day wouldn't have been called a buck, of course, but they were there to make money. You get the point I'm making. And he says, you're devouring widows' houses, taking advantage of them, and then you'll go out after ripping off widows and make a long prayer like you're so religious and you're so pious. He says, you're going to receive greater damnation for the way you're acting. I promise you that. So this is a serious, serious thing in the eyes of our Lord and then in Luke 21, he looks up and sees rich men, rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. 
And I'm sure there were some large amounts going in, but there's also a certain poor widow who's casting in just two mites. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of the mite. It's, it is a teeny tiny coin of teeny tiny value. She cast it in, and Jesus says, of a truth, I'm telling you, this poor widow has cast in more than they all. Than all, who, all these rich folks. She has cast in more because they cast in out of their abundance. It was no big sacrifice for them to give this much because they had so much left over after that. This woman gave all that she had. She gave all the living that she had. She's focused on spiritual things not material things. And then someone says, Jesus, look at the temple. Isn't it amazing? See all these costly stones and jewels and gifts that are part of the temple. And Jesus says to them, uh, you know what? The time's coming when there will not be one stone left here that's not been thrown down. This temple that you value and esteem so much because of its ornate appearance and its wealth that it signifies to you, someday God's going to knock this building flat. And he did. When the Romans came in 70 AD and destroyed that temple, their focus was on all the wrong things. Now, as we start coming to the close of the book of Luke, we see the covetous disciple. And you know, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is drawn nigh. It's called the Passover. The chief priests and scribes were looking for any way possible to kill him, but they didn't know how they could get it done because they were afraid of the people. And so here comes Satan, here comes Judas, and they merge together. Judas is of the twelve. He went his way. He communed with the chief captains and the priests how he might betray him unto them. They were glad and covenanted to give him money for 30 pieces of silver, which is not that much money. It's the price of a common slave. Judas, are you so desperate for money that you'll sacrifice the Lord's life for 30 pieces of silver? We know that Judas was a thief, according to John 12. He had the bag, the treasury. He kept up with the treasury, uh, the disciples, and he was a thief. And he complained about how much waste went into this woman's gift to Jesus and how much this ointment cost that was being wasted in his mind. This is the attitude, a covetous man Judas was. And look what happened. Look what it led to. He sought opportunity to betray him. He was looking for a way to make some money off of this. How sad, how tragic. And then those chapter 23, thieves on the cross. Why, why are they up there dying? Because they're covetous men. That's why people steal they want something that's not theirs, so they take it. That's covetousness. And what did it lead to in this case? It led to their crucifixion. They were put to death, one on the right hand of Jesus, the other one on the left hand of Jesus. And notice there are two thieves crucified with him, according to verse 38. And one of them, at first, by the way, both of them, according to the gospel accounts, cast things into his teeth and said ridiculing things. But one of them is going to change his heart. But one of them speaks up and says, if you're really the Son of God, save yourself. If you're really Christ, the anointed one, save yourself and us. And the other answered, said, don't you fear God? He says, we're in the same condemnation, and we receive the due reward of our deeds. We deserve to be up here hanging because we are thieves. This man has done nothing amiss, Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus told him, today you will be with me in paradise. Suddenly, this man's life ends that day. But think about what happened for that thief after that day came to a conclusion, after his death. Nothing he had ever tried to steal in life had ever been of the value of what he was about to enjoy with the Lord in paradise. And I want you to just think about this as, as we close out in the last few minutes of giving the invitation here. What is it that you prize, you cherish? What material thing would you be least reluctant to give up? Your phone? 
I know that we're so <laughs> tied to our phones nowadays that if we walk out of the house and forget it, it's like, oh no, I can't, I can't, I can't survive today if I don't have my phone. And for some businesses, uh, it's very essential. But you know, we are so wedded to those devices that if we don't have them for a few minutes, it's like we think, oh no, 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 what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm telling you on the day of judgment, your phone is not going to be the most important thing on your mind. It's not gonna be, well, uh, let me get my phone. You're going to be focused on the one who's coming back and life eternal, things that matter. In fact, <clears throat> I want you to close out with me by going to 2 Peter chapter 3. This is where we're going to end our Wednesday night message, but I do want to introduce this concept to you right now. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 that though some were mocking the coming of the Lord as never going to happen because it hasn't happened, he said, no, it's not a matter of the Lord being slack concerning his promise, no. As some men would count slackness, verse 9, it, the only reason he hasn't come back yet, he's long-suffering to usward. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he said, I'm going to tell you something right now. The day of the Lord will come, and it will come like a thief in the night. Thief doesn't tell you when he's coming. It's a surprise. If you knew it was coming, you wouldn't let him do what he does. So it's like, oh, I didn't see it coming. So those date setters that want to tell you that the Lord told us exactly when he's coming back have missed the point. He's coming as a thief in the night. We don't know when that's going to be. And so he's coming as a thief in the night. Then what? What happens then? Does Jesus say, all right, everyone, go to your house, get your stuff, the stuff that you value, bring it with you, and then we'll have the judgment day, and wherever you're going, you can take your stuff with you that you that you brought with you to the judgment day. Friends, on the day of judgment, my television on my wall, nothing that I have in my garage, in my toolbox, in my closet, no device in my electronic array of devices is going to be on my mind. It's going to be the Lord and eternity and I get to go be with Jesus? Yes. What's going to happen to all my stuff? The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved... What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, seeing that all of your, since all of your stuff's going to be completely destroyed someday, where should your focus be? I did a funeral, and as they were crossing by the casket for the last time, passing by the casket for the last time, every family member that was filing by for the last time put two brand new $1 bills in the coffin, closed the lid, the money's still in there to this day. Why did they do that? This loved one had a unique quirk. When he was in the hospital, he would say to them, now, if they discharge me in the morning before you get back here and you're going home, you're gonna sleep in your own bed, I'm not letting you sleep in a chair, you're gonna get a good night's rest, if they let me out of here before you get back in the morning, I want to have enough money on me to buy a cup of coffee and a newspaper. So you tuck $2 in my sock. That shows you how long ago this was too, by the way. $2 in my sock. That'll give me enough money to buy a cup of coffee and a newspaper. So every night before they'd leave, he'd say, do I have my two? Do I have my two? Yeah, you got your two. Okay, you can go. As they filed by his casket for the last time, they put two brand new $1 bills in his casket. Every family member did it. Close the lid. You're probably thinking, I'll write a check for that and just put the check back in there, right? Friends, the point that I'm making to you is I know that they knew he wasn't going to spend that. It was symbolic. But what if they put $2 million in there? Would that change anything? I just don't know how to get it across. Sometimes we think that 
the things we go after here are going to make us happy. But I heard someone say, and I wish I could take credit for it, but I cannot. I love the statement. I'm going to repeat it. What you go after here will determine where you go hereafter. What you go after here is going to determine where you go hereafter. And if your mind is constantly on the dollars and cents during services as the gospel's being preached, you're thinking of how to make money. I would, you know, if I did this, I better make some more money. Or maybe if I sold that, I could... And maybe if I did this, maybe I could get that house. Maybe I, and all these material things swirling through our minds while the Word of God is being preached. Think of the man in Luke 12. Master, make my brother divide the inheritance with me. Interrupt a sermon of the Lord Jesus Christ to try to settle a financial dispute. Wow. How much are we like that? Are we? I hope that we're not because... On the day of judgment, the only thing that's going to matter is the condition of our soul. That's why the Bible says in verse 13, as we look forward to this new dwelling place that he has gone to prepare for us, that we know we're going to rise to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord in, in this new dwelling place that uh, is going to be our new dwelling place. Yes, we're going to be able to go there. And verse 14 says, Beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So, question of the hour. Are you in him without spot and blameless? If not, then let's get you that way so that when he comes, you'll be ready. You'll be ready. And the thing that will be uppermost in your mind is, yes, my Lord is here. I get to live with him forever. This is marvelous. This is going to be wonderful. I'll serve him there in heaven above, and I'll be able to enjoy life forevermore with him. What a wonderful thing that's going to be. And if you're not a child of God, if you don't have the cleansing blood of Christ applied to your soul, then please purify your soul in obeying the timeless truth that says Jesus Christ is the only one who can save you. He came to seek and save you, Luke 19.10. Will you obey his gospel by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of sins, as the book of Acts teaches all those converts did? And if you're already a child of God by obeying the gospel plan of salvation, are you, like the prodigal, thinking that life might be better out there in the world of materialism than it is in the world of spiritualism with God? I, I hope not, but please, whatever your need is, Know that God knows your heart. He knows mine. He knows what I think. Ask yourself, is God pleased with what you think about what matters most in life? If not, correct it as together we stand, as we sing, won't you please?